Let's take a look at what happens when we try doing measurements assuming the postulates from special relativity. So in this example, we're going to have two different reference frames. One, we have somebody who can be standing inside of a moving train, and another person who is standing outside. So this person standing on the ground would be able to look inside this train, this is open, everything there will be apparent to them. And also inside the train, we're going to set up two different mirrors, one at the top, one at the bottom, and we can then have basically light just bouncing up and down in this direction. So to define our reference frames, let's say that we are going to do first our measurements inside the train, and in that case, if we're inside the train, the light beam is just moving up and down in the x direction we'd have it, then quite simply everything is in the same reference frame, so we'll call this inside the train reference frame S. And outside we'll have this person looking inside, so everything inside the train is moving relative to him, so he's in a different reference frame. We'll call that S prime. So here is the interesting dilemma we want to consider. The person inside the train is going to look at the light bouncing up and down, up and down, and in particular, let's just think about the face when the light is moving from the bottom of the mirror to the top. And let's give this person a really accurate clock, extremely good reflexes, and that person will time how long it takes the light to go from the bottom mirror to the top. So we have some distance d that the light is going to cover. And on the other hand, the person outside here isn't going to see light just moving straight up and down. Instead, the light has to bounce up and at an angle. Why is that? Well, because you would think that, well, the light has some sort of, or at least I should say the mirrors have some sort of forward velocity, so when the light is going straight up, it needs to meet the mirror in this person's uh, reference frame. The mirror is moving forward, so it looks like the light's going to have some sort of angle. It's the same sort of thing that if you were in some sort of an aircraft, and here is my crummy airplane. If you're sitting there inside and you have a ball and you throw it straight up and down, well, to you, just go straight up and down. On the other hand, somebody looking outside is going to see the ball is going to be going in some sort of parabolic path. And the size of that parabola will be dependent on how fast the plane is going. So you'd expect when you're going from one reference frame to the other, the path is going to look different. So we're going to do the same sort of thing with light. It's going to now look like it's shooting off at some angle, and so it's going to cover some other distance. Let's call that distance d prime. Now, let's set this up a little bit more algebraically. So with this setup, we first have the distance d as measured as just going straight up and down inside the train. We have this other distance, d prime, the path that the light appears to take according to the person outside. And then we have some sort of distance here that accounts for uh, the extra length that we've had to go. So we basically have already set up a uh, right triangle here. And again, to give this definition, how long should this side be? Well, it should depend on how fast the train is going and how long it takes for the light normally to go from the bottom mirror down here to the top. So, let's write down a few points then of definition of how these distances relate. Distance d is going to be measured by the first hand side, and the distance d is going to depend on how fast the light is normally going and how long it took to get to the top. So, this is just a simple kinematic equation. Distance equals velocity times time. In the case of no acceleration, this is exactly right. Simple. d prime, on the other hand, we still have the speed of light, and then times whatever time the person outside would be measuring. Let's not assume that both times are the same. And you already are going to notice, well, haven't I already made a mistake? The velocity I'm plugging in here for c, well, doesn't it have to cover the exact same uh, it has to cover a greater distance in the same amount of time. Shouldn't this velocity be faster? 
that's what you would normally expect because the velocity should now be the sum of the velocity of the speed of light up plus the velocity of the train forward. So I'd have to add some sort of velocities together with the Pythagorean theorem. But remember, Einstein's seculent postulate says that the speed of light is the same in all reference frames. So whether I'm in the S frame or the S prime frame, C has to be the same. That is Einstein's postulate. We can't break that. And then lastly, this distance as measured along is going to then be the velocity that the train is going and times the time as measured by the outside observer, not the inside observer because this velocity isn't apparent to them. The time that he measures is just the time it takes to go straight up and down. This person inside the train never sees this velocity vector because there's no velocity in his own reference frame. So we've basically now set up a right triangle, so we could just do Pythagorean theorem, where side squared plus side squared equals hypotenuse squared, right? So let's set that up. That means we would have side d squared plus velocity squared time prime squared for the two sides of the triangle, and that would equal our d prime squared. So those are all the distances in play. And now let's just substitute in our two distances, d and d prime. So a quick substitution. That's what we would see. So we also or I see right now that what we've done has no dependence on what was this original length here. It doesn't matter actually how tall the train car is. So that's a nice bit of invariance. This is only going to be a simple translation then between the time measured inside, the time measured outside. So what do we see if we do a little bit more algebra? Let's give ourselves a little bit more space to do the final bit of solving. So I'm going to measure, or I'm going to divide both sides by the speed of light squared, and I'm going to try to get t's on one side, t primes on the other, and I'm going to get this solution. So that the velocity measured by someone outside of the moving train, someone who is then moving relative to our light bouncing up and down, is going to measure a different time than the person inside. And that difference is going to be this sort of square root factor here. And we're going to actually use a bit of notation where we use the Greek letter gamma to equal 1 divided by square root of 1 minus v squared over c squared. And so we can rewrite this same equation as t prime equals gamma times time. Now this gamma factor that we have right here, you'll notice that for any velocity v you plug in greater than zero, the gamma is going to end up being greater than one. If velocity is zero, then gamma is just one, because if this is zero, then the denominator is just square root of one, nice and simple. Plug in a negative velocity, you're still going to get some result greater than 1. So what this means is that since gamma is always greater than or equal to 1, the velocity as measured by somebody in a different reference frame is going to be greater than the time measured by somebody not moving to the device in question. This is time dilation, the time measured moving to a different reference frame is going to be greater than the rest frame time as measured. And so the notation we might use is that we would call this time here the proper time, the time as measured when you're not moving relative to the uh, thing you are directly measuring, and then the not proper time, because unproper time or improper time sounds like a moral dilemma. So this simply results from just a little bit of Pythagorean theorem, and then the assumption from Einstein's postulate that the speed of light is seen as the same no matter what reference frame. Make that tiny little assumption, do a little math, and you discover two people don't agree on time anymore if they are in different reference frames. Shouldn't necessarily say they don't agree, but they have to now say, all right, if I'm going to take your time as you measure in your reference frame and translate it to mine, I need to put in this multiplicative factor. Now let's consider the case of what happens when you're measuring the effects of 
length when you're going from one reference frame to another. So let's consider the case where you have two bodies sitting out in the middle of space. Let's say there are a couple of stars. And you have some sort of rocket ship that's going to go from one star to the next, and it's going to be shooting off with some velocity. If you are on one of these stars or one of those solar systems, the other star is not moving relative to you. So the stars are in the same reference frame, and the ship is in a moving reference frame. So if you were measuring the distance from one star to the next on one of these stars, well, that distance you measure, we'll just call that length L. And on the other hand, we could say then what distance the spaceship measures will give it a different uh, measurement. But if we were going to ask then, all right, well, how long is it going to take the ship to get from point A to point B? From one star to the next. And remember, if we want to do this correctly, we have to be going from one reference frame to the other, and it needs to look the same sort of thing. So if the ship is going from one star to the other, that should look identical to the two stars moving backward at the same sort of velocity v. That means it would look something like this sort of setup. The two stars are now shooting backward with some velocity v, and the ship is stationary. So this would be looking like if we go from the reference frame first of the two stars, and then going to the reference frame of the spaceship. Both of these should be identical if we are doing all of our translations correctly. So now let's say, let's say the distance the ship measured between these two stars, we'll call that L prime. Again, we can't assume that the two lengths are the same anymore. Now, if the ship is being stationary and this thing is shooting by, well, somebody on board can just hold their stopwatch, hit start once the stars start moving, hit stop once they get there, and that person on board is measuring velocity without, or sorry, measuring time on board and not moving at all. So that person is measuring the proper time. So in that case, on board the ship, there's a relationship between the length as measured in this reference frame and the time that ship measures. So notice that I am not using a prime on time. The person on board the ship is measuring proper time. They are measuring time in their reference frame and they are not moving. There are basically two events that happen in the same place according to the ship. Basically there's the event of there's a star at the tail end, and then eventually this star gets over here and is at the tail end again. So both the events, quote unquote, of the star being right behind the ship happen in the same place according to the ship at the back end. So both those things are happening in the same spot according to our astronaut on there. That person is measuring proper time. This is a really important subtle point and is probably the thing that makes it the most confusing when going from one reference frame to another. The question of who measures proper length, proper time. Now, of course, that means conversely, if we were back up here in this case and measuring everything uh, that we're seeing there, well, the length as measured by the two planets, or the two stars, well, they're not moving relative to each other, so they're measuring proper length. So that's why there's not going to be any prime there. And then that length is going to be then how fast the ship is moving, and then at time it takes to get from point A to point B. So this person is not measuring proper time, because the events they're looking at are going to be in different places. They have to actually worry about this sort of relativistic effect. So you can see now with this sort of equation set up, I could now rewrite this equation here, and instead of uh, having time prime here, I could substitute in the proper time. So if we were to do that, that means length here is going to be velocity times time 
times that gamma factor. And notice we have velocity times time here, the same notation we have there. So this is the not proper length here. So again, we actually have a relationship between length and not the proper length. So if we substitute this in here and do just a quick algebra switch, we're going to find then that the not proper length is going to be the same as taking the proper length defi uh, divided by the gamma factor there, the relativistic factor. So this is length contraction. Since we, again, know gamma is always greater than or equal to 1, whatever the proper length is, the not proper length has to be equal or smaller. So what that would mean then, from the point of view of a spaceship who is not measuring the proper length, the faster those stars are zipping along, the greater this velocity v is, basically, that's going to be a larger gamma factor, and what would be the normal distance between those two stars is going to get smaller and smaller. Well then, that means that basically it's going to look like the distance that ship has to travel is now significantly contracted. So to review, we have then two major equations defining what's going on. The translation between proper time t and not proper time t prime. And then we have the effective length contraction when we're going between proper length and not proper length. It's also a very important thing to measure or mention about one thing with this length contraction business. The length contraction is only going to be in the dimension of velocity. So if you have some sort of body, something a bit cubical, say, let's draw a crummy 3D cube. If that velocity is zipping off in this direction, according to some other observer, they're going to notice that the length will be contracted in the direction that that ship is moving, that box is moving. So the x component of this cube here is going to get contracted. But the y and z components, there is no velocity in that direction, and so there actually won't be any contraction. So if we're moving fast enough, instead of it being a nice cube, it's going to look more like a squished cube. But the, the y and z uh, lengths of the cube will be completely unchanged. And if the velocity is in some direction that it's partially x, partially y, partially z, then you, of course, have a little bit of fun time uh, trick to do to work all of that out. But usually you just want to use a coordinate system that just points along the direction of velocity and just save yourself a lot of work.